subtitle cool we've been recording right now so i say hi again and how proud i'm to be here thank you so much so um the subtitle was really long is the summary of the presentation so integration of formal learning and open resources to boost education in times of crisis because the actual core here is about the crisis it's not just about what is happening with the pandemic okay because pandemic is one thing but it's not the only one so the first thought that came to my mind was uh, something that i uh, i contributed to and i shared a couple of years ago with the ministry of china the ministry of education in china okay? i was uh, they call it disruptive classes and disruptive learning and i thought well this is a, a wonderful thought okay so how can we keep seamlessly the learning flow, the learning experience, no matter the actual condition or the actual uh, obstacle or the actual setting that we are living through or we're living by, okay? So um, how can we actually, actually be of support also during COVID-19, but not only? So this came with a very clear rationale from my end, okay? If you want to uh, uh, or need to know a little more about what I do usually, this is my blog, transgeniclearning.com. It's not really updated, so maybe it's, I didn't put anything there for the last year. It was very busy with the pandemic, but it will be updated uh, now in July also. Go there and you can catch up on e-learning, open education and a number of things. Let me introduce a little where I come from. I come from here, Logroño, as uh, very well pronounced by Professor Olivier. Uh, La Rioja is there in the north center of Spain. And it would take 2000 hours to come to South Africa and Northwest University, at least one of their campuses, um, walking. So almost 11,000 kilometers. So it's quite a, it's quite a, quite a ride, okay, quite a ride. Uh, but no matter, because that's a matter because we work online as we are doing right now with the lecture. So at UNIR we have 40,000 students and almost 200 uh, undergraduate and graduate uh, degrees and programs, okay? We are 100% online, including examinations. Before the pandemic, people have to go physically to take the exam. But now with the pandemic, people can do it at home with all the uh, proctoring uh, processes and biometrics required for that. They have premises in, we have premises in, in a number of countries, mainly Latin America, Spain, and also the United States. And we have a number of projects and research agreements and a number of chairs, okay? We are very active working on what? Basically working on this, UNIR ITEP, which is the uh, Institute for Research, Innovation, and education, okay? And uh, so we work on educational technology and educational innovation in a number of topics. For instance, uh, formal, informal learning, um, performance estimate, user interaction, gamification, open educational resources. So we actually work on what I'm going to discuss today. Our slogan, our motto is better learning, better teaching. In fact, it should include also better academic management, but it was not that sexy, okay? So I cut it off and I trim it off and I say, better learning, better teaching. But we should think also on of these uh, academic managers, okay? So uh, we have a number, uh, have uh, done a number of activities I commented before between Northwest University and myself, Anuri. So the, the position as extraordinary professor, uh, supported by the research unit uh, as uh, self-directed learning, uh, led by Professor Elsa Mentz. Also, we have submitted recently a bid uh, to the Canadian Research Fund. It's called Conflict Free STEM, and with the professors Jacques Olivier, Neil Peterson, and Joseph De Bell. And we did uh, last week a workshop on editing, on uh, scientific editing, um, hosted by Professor Olivier. And we are about to publish now in September a book with Springer, as I commented before. Uh, with title Radical Solutions for Education in Africa. So we have a number of connections and more to come, I hope, more to come, I hope. So the point of this um, talk today is about crisis, but Mark the Bowell, it's not about crisis with I, it's about crisis with E. We have a number of crises. Why? Because if we go to this atlas, 
this atlas is about, it's not really updated, but it's just to give you a glimpse about the conflicts across the globe. There are around 50 conflicts. When they say conflicts, we, we say wars, okay? Uh, declare, non declare, but they are wars. I, every single continent but Australia, okay? Um, so uh, if we talk about migrations, this is a map with all the bubbles where there are some sort of migration. And we have in every single country in the world, all of them are represented, okay? Uh, more or less, but all of them are represented. So migration is also happening and it's also a crisis, okay? And this is the, about the Katrina, okay? Katrina, Katrina, depending on potato, potato, how, how to say things, okay? Um, and it happened in the States. And this is happening in uh, Southeast Asia about the tsunami. And this is happening in Mexico. Uh, an earthquake and this happened also in uh, Nepal, another earthquake. It happened even in the highest summit in the world in at Mount Everest, okay? Um, so crises are happening all the time and this is the last one, the information taken from the last week. Um, so what we have is 189 million cases. 4 million deaths and a number of vaccinations there. So it's happening everywhere. And these are the official track, of, of course. There is the unofficial track. We are all very much aware that many things are happening without being actually registered. And this is what happens in South Africa, okay? We have uh, over 2,000 cases, over 65,000 deaths, and almost 5 million doses of the vaccine administered. So uh, it's happening everywhere. But again, it's not just about the COVID. It's also about other crises. So whatever we can do right now in the scope of the pandemic can be applied to many other settings and, um, and conditions and, uh, I don't know, unfortunate events that happen all the time worldwide. So what I'm selling here is the use of open education. So we need to understand that open education usually is um, listed as a set of things. Open education is not just about education. It's also about content. It's about access. It's about technology and accreditation and licensing. There are nine pillars for open education. Okay, This is according one author. There is another author here that talks about the 10 dimensions of open education, okay? About the strategy, content, access, recognition. The point here, it doesn't matter if we count up to nine or up to 10. The point is that open education is not just about one single thing, but about a combination of things. For instance, we talk about open science, which is one of the things addressed by the openness movement, okay? And when we talk about open science, there is also a number here, okay? This uh, result of, of things that actually uh, provide meaning to the topic. So open source, open access, open educational resources, and um, open data, of course. There are a number of things, okay? So we need to think a little broadly. We need to be flexible enough to think that openness is also the way in which we think the uh, the, we see the things through. So we need to be open to talk about openness and to integrate openness into our academic world. For instance, we can talk about open education facilitates functional diversity, which is one of the main targets, I think, because functional diversity is not just about handicapped people. They usually call handicapped people, people with some uh, sort of concern or limitation about the sight, about the, the mobility, about the cognitive response, um, cognitive response and all the other things happen along the way in different manners. So my uh, uh, father-in-law, he's 93 years old and he's perfectly lucid, but of course he's 93 years old. So there are mobility restrictions, they are understanding with a little deaf and a number of things, but they're still pretty functional, I think. So is he handicapped? No, he's not. Definitely he's not. But he provides, he requires a sort of functional diversity into his environment. So, but it happens to me. I have glasses here. I'm 51 years old. I have glasses. 
If I take my glasses off, I cannot Google the screen. I just see it says, and this happened uh, since two years ago. Uh, until I was 49, I could see perfectly well, and now suddenly, boom, I have to use a couple of glasses to see everything, okay? So I'm functional diversity guy, I'm not handicapped, but, and what happens with open education? That this is a way to democratize the content, the access, and a number of things to everyone, no matter the uh, functionality that they got or that they miss, okay? We can, call, we can talk about navigation and keyboard accessible and predictable and video alternatives, a number of things that you can read there on the screen, okay? And open education also allows for that. So we can reach more people. Right? The objective here, the idea, the message, is that we can reach more people, okay? This also happens with the educational software. We have a number of educational software in the world, okay? We can talk about games, about creativity, about practice, a number of things. And the, the one that I prefer most, uh, the, down to the right, organization and planning, because usually we talk about teaching and learning and what's happening with planning and scheduling is a key part of this, okay? So, um, working online and working with open learning and open access and open data also allows for using more technology and more services and more solutions, okay? So again, we can outreach more people and more diversity to these people. And don't forget that we can do all that based on the very basic core of our activity. Uh, Professor Oliviera and myself, we are UNESCO chairs, and we have very much in, in, into account, okay, in our mind, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations, okay? Because usually we're with this one, which is uh, education. But education is also related to uh, economic growth and it's related also to uh, uh, good health and with uh, zero hunger and a number of them, okay? A number of them. So education in this case is related to a number of uh, sustainable development goals by the United Nations and the common sense, okay? If you are more and better educated, you can have other options in your life, okay? Other realities can uh, become uh, true, okay? So uh, the point is that open education really enlarges the, uh, all, all this, okay? is make the possibilities broader, the diversity broader, the, the, the events, the possibilities to connect the network, the resources, everything has no limit. We can go to Finland in one click or to Australia, or Indonesia or Colombia or Alaska in one click, okay? And we can talk inside Africa, okay? With all this richness usually out of the country and talk to Zimbabwe and to uh, Morocco and Ivory Coast. I don't know, there are so many possibilities there. So we talk about education, but in fact, we are not talking just about education. Education facilitates and allows for an additional number of things, okay? And I'm going to give you, I think that after this core message, I think it's pretty simple, but has to be said in my view, I'm going to give you a number of examples, okay? A number of examples of how open education can be actually integrated into the university uh, usual business. Please keep in mind, I'm giving you examples now based on my host uh, university, which is La Rioja, because we are a private university. This means that we are a business. Everything that we don't get, any money that we don't get as an income or tuition is money that we have to spend. And on top of that, we have decided that we need to invest in open education, meaning that we lose money because we are a public service and we have a, a university social responsibility okay, on this. So we provide a number of resources, services that can be easily integrated to a company like us and of course to a university like Northwest University and other universities and public resources and institutions across the country and the continent, okay? So the first example is what we call the video OER repository. We have a video OER repository called tv.unir.net. You can go there and you can find a number of video lectures and open classes like this one, prestige lectures, 
uh, master classes and interviews. Most of them are in Spanish because our target is uh, Spanish speaking, but there are also a number in English and in French and Portuguese. Okay. Um, there is nothing in Africans yet, but you are very much welcome if you want to go there with one of your, I, I, I remember that uh, South Africa has 11 official languages. Uh, sorry if I mistake, because you can take any of them and we are we welcome any of the lectures that you can give and we upload them there to the repository with pleasure, okay? So the OER video cast is like an iceberg and we keep a number of layers there. The peak there, the, the see that you can see is that we provide open and free access Mean that you go there and Google and click and go and you don't have to leave any data. The second thing is that you go to, uh, to this place as a register access. The register access is that you need to leave your data, but after that, you don't have to pay anything, okay? So it's not open and free, it's register and free. It still is a good deal, okay? And the rest is the educational community access. So you have to pay your tuition. And at the end, we have a sort of, um, a sort of distribution, meaning 20% is open and free, 20% is registered and free, and 60% is pay view, okay? This means that 40%, 20 plus 20, so 40%, okay, can actually be accessed without paying anything. It's open and or free, okay? And we register over 1,300 pieces every week for the last 10 years. If you make the calculations right now, it's about 700,000 pieces. We are just leading the, the million pieces of information there. And we do it for free, 40% of that, okay? 40% is almost 300,000 pieces for free uh, that you can go there. It's a uh, integration of open access in this case and open content into the academic programs. This is the first case study. The second case study, okay, is the what we call the open education portal, open ED. Okay, open ED is um, a repository of courses that have been developed with uh, public funding. So usually coming from Europe, so Europe um, really makes their resources to be free for the public. Everything that's supported by public funding has to be publicly uh, distributed later, okay, and delivered. So there are a number of projects like Keystone, Community, and others, social seducement, that develop a number of resources, meaning courses, and we put it together under this management system called OpenID. Unir.net. You can go there and you can get registered for free. As an opposition to the TV Unir, which is mainly in Spanish, this is mainly in other languages. We have, of course, some courses in Spanish, but mainly in English and in Arabic, in Macedonian, in Greek, a number of languages. And you are free to go there and request to join and you follow. And we uh, approach a number of topics like competence achievement for labor market and basic skills to integrate open education, um, disaffected children. You can go there. This is also a nice way to integrate formal education and university work with open educational resources. Out of this, there is a very specific case called Open Game Project, okay? The Open Game Project is a game, it's a game, a game to train the competencies to work with open education, okay? This is very, I think, very unusual. But you can go there anytime. And in fact, I'm going to do it with you right now, live. This is without any safety net, okay? I'm going to do here to open game. And you can see by yourself that this is an European project and it's for free, okay? You can go and see the results. There is a handbook of successful open teaching practices. And later you have an open game scores, curriculum and content. And later you have the online learning game. And you can go even to the game, which is here. And you can play the game if you prefer so, okay? You click and suddenly you start playing. I don't remember my, sorry, I don't remember my, my, um, 
I think it's 2020. Oh, yes, I remember my password. And you can start uh, uh, and play the game exactly the same, OK? Well, anyway, it's just a game to watch and to work on open education. So you can come here and try to achieve the competencies that usually are supposed to help introducing and integrating open education into academic, uh, academic formal programs, OK? So I really encourage you to go there. This is case study number three too, but, but there is also case study number three. Case study number three is about the open education policy. And this is something that I think that it might be interesting because the point is not that um, you can um, do things into the open as a freelance. The point is that the university at large, every single layer, every single statement of the university has to be focused on open education. So you need to integrate everyone to work with open education. One thing is that me as a teacher, I use YouTube videos, for instance, that's okay, but it's not enough. We require a policy. So this is the first policy that was developed for a, a, an open university uh, like ours, okay? An online university like ours. And it was also the first one to be developed by a, a university in Spanish worldwide. So you can go here and you can use it for free. There is a number of uh, topics, table of content, talking about priorities, for instance, integrate the amount of new resources released as open educational resources, integrate existing OER as appropriate into new courses, support the creation of OER as academic resources and so on, okay? So you can go here, you can check it, you can use it for free. It's completely up to you. It's uh, open to use and reuse as long as you cite it properly, okay? And I'm going to give you just a hint of the people who came here uh, to develop this, I was the editor, but also we had in the list of people reviewing and contributing to this open policy, it was the vice rector for students, it was the dean of engineering, it was the vice rector for doctorate, for research, the vice rector for faculty, for educational development, the rector himself, and later a number of external reviewers coming from Morocco, United Kingdom, USA, Spain, Argentina, Russia, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, a number of people, okay? So in fact, it was also the approach very open to everyone. And this is very relevant to you. So if you want to actually integrate open education into the university, my suggestion, if you are not doing so, uh, so far, and if you want to make it a little broader, is welcome everyone in. In fact, be a little, a little, um, a little sneaky, force everyone in, okay? So the teachers, the tutors, the professors, the students, the janitors, the executive board, the manager, the rector, the president, everyone is involved into the policy. This is very important to be successful. If you don't involve everyone, the policy will not work and open education will be just a sniper effort. Me, myself, the teacher, who is the crazy guy who is using open education. Has to be all together. This is the third case study that I want to share with you. But there are also other supports. For instance, this thing. Yes, picture the, 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 the idea. If we use open education, potentially we will have more students. We will have more potential users to our services. The video repository, the policy, the courses, a number of things. So we can build up on big data and we can produce this type of things. We can produce dashboards like this one, okay? Very important. So we can retrieve information from people, the user tracking, okay, databases, and we can analyze what is happening and also project into the future what is happening. The point is that if we 
can actually retrieve that information and make projections, we will help rerouting and adapting the learning flow and also the teaching flow uh, better. Because remember one thing, it's not just about the student. Okay, we are talking about crisis and integration and it's not just about the student, it's also about the professors and every single teaching support that we got there. In our experience as an open online university, what we've got is that the student sometimes gets disconnected, sometimes gets, I think, feels a little down, even depressed, um, because they feel isolated, they are alone, they are in a rural environment, they don't get proper connection, and now with the confinement out of the pandemic, even worse. And we forget that the teacher, the professor, is also going through the same condition, so through the same status, through the same setting and restrictions, okay? So the student requires some support, but the teacher requires some support. And many times, it's not a technical support. It's a social, emotional support, which is really important. In my experience, we have a very strict policy and every other week, meaning every two weeks, we call by phone. We call the students by phone. There is a tutor, academic tutor, and they call them, okay? How are you doing? What is your life about? Do you have any problem? And it's a sort of a psychological support because in fact, they don't talk about any technicalism. There are uh, support for that. They don't talk about the academic content. There is also a support for that. They talk to them as a coaching okay, activity. And we have right now between 40 and 50,000 students and every two weeks we call everyone. And on top of that, about the researchers and the professors, the teachers there, the director of the master program or the bachelor program or the research institute call their team also on a periodic basis. So it's not every two weeks, maybe it's every month, but they call everyone in the team. Me as a head of my institute with 22 people, I talk to them every week. And sometimes two or three times because we are doing things together. But every week I call everyone with any excuse how are you doing? And most of the time we talk about the technical issues and always there is like a 10%, 20% of the discussion that goes into the personal things and the family and the restriction and, and the vaccination and a number of things. This cycle, emotional, social, emotional support is the key, is, to me, is the human touch, is the key for success, integration uh, with the integration of open and educational resources and open education into academic programs when we have to work from home and we have to study from home, okay? In all these um, disaggregated approaches, any additional touch that we can give to achieve a more aggregated, a dashboard of emotions, content, relations, um, the more the better. Okay, so just give me, let me give you a closing thought. Open science and science education are a key to support education in times of crisis. Always. <coughs> However, not just them. They are a support always, not in times of crisis. So hopefully in one month, one year, the pandemic is over. But many other things can happen, okay? And we don't have, we shouldn't forget what is going on right now, what happened in the past with all these things that I put you and project uh, before, okay, I projected before. So things will happen and we have to take the lessons from this experience and try to replicate, okay? Try to actually reapply. Um, and don't forget that it's not just about all these times of crisis. There are other things. Open education is good, but we can also use learning analytics. We can also use 
a number of tools and disciplines to support open education. It's not just about mm, giving one PDF for free and giving one lesson for free. The point is that if I have 1,000 students, I need to work with them in a proper way. So I need to run semi-automatic processes. I cannot attend one by one. I cannot address one by one. I have to cluster and group people. And learning analytics allow for grouping, clustering, and providing personalized feedback by groups. So I can actually work with all of them at the same time without uh, working one by one, because individually speaking, it's quite impossible. And across this, just keep in mind one thing. It doesn't matter if we uh, install a repository of open educational resources, if we run a video repository lesson, if we open a learning analytics tool, as long as we don't have a very clear instructional design supporting this, it's completely worthless, okay? Because what matters is all the methodology behind. We have to come up with a very good plan, an academic plan, a, a, a personal feeling human touch plan to be efficient, to be close, to be effective, to provide some impact for the future and some integration into the labor market, the usual things that we talk, to develop the core competence, the specific competences to, to make all this happening. The actual core is instructional design behind. And later we can choose the toys, we can choose the, the, the tools to use, okay? And in addition to that, don't forget the human touch, very important, key to us. You can technically provide support, but if there is no additional component that makes the contact closer, the student closer, the teacher closer, we will be failing epically. It's very important to provide both things, the instructional design and the human touch. These are my uh, contact details. You can go anytime to the link there, to the Twitter, and also my personal email on the blog side. So please don't forget going there if you need anything and drop me a line. I will be really pleased to uh, discuss any further matter with you. Professor Olivier gave me 40 minutes for the talk and I have my internal clock here that says that it's 40 minutes sharp. So the lecture is over and now I'm open for any sort of discussion and questions from your weekend. Um, thank you so much for your attention.